All right, and welcome back to the show, Seth Golden. What's going on, buddy? Hey, David. Glad to be back. It's, it's been uh, quite a while. A lot has happened uh, this... you know, in, the, in the market since uh, we last you know, got a chance to sit down and talk. So here's our opportunity. Uh, I know I've just you know, been working as I always do. Uh, phenomgroup.com, my website. A um, lot of active members, so, you know, we have a private Twitter feed. Um, so that's kept me, you know, very busy throughout the year. I have daily articles that I um, write as well as weekly research reports um, on the website. Um, so it keeps me busy uh, as well as, you know, just keeping up with the news cycle and where we are. So, Well, it's a good day to have you on because uh, we've, Broken the all-time low in UVXY today after many, many months of uh, anticipation. I, I really think that the spotlight is going to come back onto the short vol trade now with with breaking that that low and with Contango being consistently over ten percent now. It seems uh, the spotlight comes back on us, and also with the VIX, it, it could close below eleven today. So that's going to bring the spotlight back on us. Yeah. I saw you were recently in the news um, yeah. with surprisingly a positive news story uh, <laughs> about you that that's pretty cool did they reach out to you yeah sean sean langois of uh market watch he had done a, a kind of a summation of um an article from the new york times on me from the february of apocalypse period and you know one, one of the things that is I, I shouldn't say it's unique, but it's constant in the media is that the, the media tends to, you know, sensationalize the negatives versus the positive stories. Um, yeah, don't get me wrong. Every now and then, you know, you get a good positive story out there. Some might say that my initial, po you know, story was positive from the New York Times last year. Um, but this year with the Volpocalypse, all you saw were negative, you know, uh, reports about me or the short volatility trade. I mean, Kramer was on TV absolutely lambasting the short volatility trade and those who participate it. I mean, calling, a, you know, every name you can think of outright morons and all this kind of stuff. So it was it was a good opportunity. And, I, you know, I, I welcomed it with Sean to discuss where I'm, you know, where I'm at now, where the short volatility trade is now, or, you know, how it's fared since February and, you know, kind of what I'm thinking about going forward. So, uh, you know, I haven't heard from anybody else, you know, to my point, it's almost as if once that negative story or that negative market event in February um, ran through the news cycle, there's been no follow up. I mean, you haven't heard anything about, oh, you know, what about all the people that went long volatility in February or March? Yeah. You know, it just, mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't get both sides of the story. So it was appreciative, you know, from, from Sean running that, that update um, on marketwatch.com. Well, I, I was reading uh, one of your most recent articles at Phenom Group about how um, you were talking about how some people are calling for a, um, you know, a, a, an end to the rally here. I think Morgan Stanley was was cited, yeah. but that you kind of uh, disagree with that with that um, view. Uh, yeah. You think the rally is going to continue? Um, I don't think about it in terms of it's a rally. I think about, you know, the market as a whole over the course of, you know, 12 months or the, the calendar year. Um, so, I mean, it's easy to say this rally, you know, should, you know, come to a halt soon. And, you, know, you know, but from, from where it halts, what happens then? Does it go down 40%, 10%, 30%? Like, Morgan Stanley is, is calling for, uh, we don't know until we know. Or does it just kind of trade sideways over the 90-day period post earnings, which has kind of been what's, what's happened after Q1. We had this, you know, really long correction period. Um, and, you know, here after Q2, it, it seems like we rally straight through earnings, you know. Um, but after that, there's not a, 
a genuine catalyst that, you know, breeds, uh, you know, investor appetite. So I would, you know, to answer your question, I would say that we are nearing the end of this particular, you know, this call it monthly rally um, through earnings season. If I look at, you know, daily, daily sentiment indicators, um, you know, they, they are kind of signaling that we are, you know, kind of nearing, nearing the peak. If I look at volatility, if I look at the VIX, it's as complacent at, as it has been, um, you know, since the, for six months. Um, I think I tweeted out just the other day there, you know, or maybe it was this morning, there goes the 11 handle on the VIX because uh, we dipped below that. So there's a lot of sentiment indicators that are suggesting the rally should at least uh, temporarily halt. And we'll see where we go from there. I noticed you talking about um, in that article about how different stocks like will lead the market at some point and uh, like small caps, um, like rotation switches from like the fangs leading everything to like different stocks leading everything. It, is there sort of a science to that or ha how does that work in broad terms? Like which stuff leads is, is it's just, uh, I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't say there's a science to it. Um, in fact, this year is, is, is somewhat of an anomaly because this is, you could characterize this year as the great rotation. We haven't had rotation, you know, from sector to sector to sector to sector in a number of years. We've had, we've had good breath in the market. Yeah, I mean, when you look at the NYSE advanced decline line, it continues to hit record levels. So the, the breath is good, but you're always going to have, no matter what bull cycle it is, you're always going to have some, you know, a handful of stocks that are leading the market. So when you have these bears out there stomping their feet saying, oh, we're fang driven, the market is completely beholden to the fang stocks. There's never been a time where only a handful of stocks don't lead a bear market. That's just how it works. It's not something that people should look at and say, oh, well, if that's the case, when they stumble, as a couple of them did during this earnings cycle, the market's going to go down. That's that that didn't happen, you know, and people position that way, thinking that it would because you, you get that constant mantra. But so far as the science I, I follow the different sectors. I follow what they're doing. I follow their 50 day moving average, their 200 day moving average to see where they are or where they could be. One of the um, sectors that we highlighted back in early June was, was the XLF, the financials. Uh, everybody had, I mean, this financials have been beaten down for the you know, better part of this year. And rather than pick one individual financial stock, be it Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, Citigroup, um, it's almost easier to pick the ETF, the sector ETF, uh, because uh, as, this, as the individual names go, the sector tends to go. And to date, knock on wood, um, you know, we have a nice return. Uh, we issued that at phenomgroup.com to our subscribers. So, you know, we're well in the money on that particular trade and or investment idea the the other ones your consumer discretionary which is xly i think we talked about this before um you had people betting against the xly and it was centered on one particular reason amazon a amazon has such a significant weighting in the consumer discretionary sector that if it stumbled Theoretically, it could, you know, result in a massive decline in the consumer discretionary retail ETF. I think the ticker is XLY, but that didn't happen. So, you know, there's a binary trade outcome there that you know could have been placed, and I'm sure many people did. But I follow the financials, the um, consumer discretionary, not healthcare so much. That may be up for its next rotation, though. I think uh, the healthcare sector is a, a little bit undervalued here and, and might be due for the next rotation out of whatever sector into, um, into healthcare. 
uh, and it could come out of the retail sector because the resale sector, I mean, it's been soaring this year. That's the XRT, the retail select sector spiders. Uh, that one, we had a fantastic trade on that earlier this year. It only took less than two months. We, we got in in the 44 um, and got out at almost 49. Um, so, and it looks toppy. I mean, retail looks extremely toppy, but at the same time, it's either looking toppy or it's looking like it's going to break out even more. You know, you just don't know. And the retail sector is reporting starting next week. So that'll be the focus of a lot of attention. Now, is the thought process with the uh, the financials that is a lot of it have to do with the, the interest rate environment right now that where interest rates are kind of moving higher and that means that uh, yeah. financials will get to, you know, uh, charge higher rates, make more money on all the loan loan activity and, you know, kind of widen the spread on some of that, some of that, those rates. Is, is that a lot of the, the thought process with the financials right now? Yeah, I think it's a, I think there's two, two, um, you know, evolving thesis when it comes to the financials. One, as you know, which is what you just articulated, um, you know, you, short, short rates, short term rates are going higher. Um, but the spreads aren't widening. Um, you know, you don't have a steepening of the spread. You have a flattening. Um, that doesn't particularly fare well for the banks. Uh, then at the, the other thesis is that loan growth isn't exactly where you want it to be. Um, so that has sustained pressure on the financial sector for the bulk of the year. But valuation always trumps you know, the, these issues and on a valuation basis, you're not going to find many individual stocks within a particular sector that are as undervalued as, as many of the financial names. Um, so at some point, investors stop looking at trailing earnings and they start looking at forward earnings and you just get this natural natural uh, appreciation in in the share prices well wells fargo which you mentioned earlier certainly had its woes in the last year or two with the scandals facing them and uh i guess maybe the trump administration has been a bit kinder to them than uh elizabeth warren and company uh, a few years ago what do you think about that whole thing with uh you know donald trump has broken uh with uh He's broken with uh, the, the, what people have done in the past in many ways. But one way is that he's actually come out and commented on the, uh, the, the rising of interest rates and uh, signaled his disapproval of, uh, of raising rates. It doesn't seem to have stifled Powell so far. Um, and I had somebody on um, a couple weeks ago, and, I, and he, he was talking about how like this whole tariff war thing is actually maybe good for good for our, our, the country and for the economy. How do you feel about the tariff war right now that's been going on? I, I, wrote, I wrote about this pretty extensively, and I continue to update my, my thoughts as the situation evolves. Uh, but in, in last week's research report, what, I, I think a lot of investors are befuddled. Be them at the institutional level or at the retail level. I think they're very befuddled as to why the market is overlooking something that could potentially, I stress potentially, impact economic activity uh, because you have the threat built in. Uh, you have the threat of inflation built into a tariff war or escalation, what have you. So I tried to really get to the crops of why the market is kind of just laughing this, I don't want to say laughing it off, but definitely shrugging it off as if it, you know, it won't happen or it won't have the impact that some think it will. I don't think it, whether it's $200 billion coming or not in tariffs on China, and 20% on autos from the EU and what have you. Um, that is not going to kill our economy. It could take as much as maybe 
you know, a half percent away, which is, you know, that's nothing to dismiss. A half percent is a big chunk. Um, so, you know, when I, when I think about it in those terms, I came to a couple of conclusions. One is the, the easiest one, which is most people simply think there's going to be a grand bargain. Um, you know, I, I, as the deadline looms, which is basically the first week of uh, September, they're either going to be implemented or they're not the first week of September. The, the review period and comment period is, is the third week of August. Implementation goes in the following week, or I should say, uh, you know, the first week of, of September. So a lot of people think there's going to be a grand bargain. But if there's not, there has to be another, you know, thesis as to why the market is overlooking it. And I think it has to do with the current news cycle and situation involving the Mueller, the Mueller investigation. And what I think a lot of people believe, or, or there's a growing belief, is that there's going to be a statement, or there's going to be some type of uh, recommendation to Congress um, that coincides with the, either the first or the middle of, of September from, from Mueller, from, uh, Robert Mueller. And it's, I think, going to focus on Donald Trump Jr. I think he's in a position where some of his statements could at least be perceived guilty, not guilty. We, you know, that's for somebody else to decide. But I think Mueller has an angle whereby he perceives the investigation might, may perceive that um, some of his testimony was not consistent with their facts. And it, you know, so there needs to be some type of, uh, you know, legal proceeding w when it comes to Donald Trump Jr. I don't think that would ever, I don't, if that's the prevailing thesis and Donald Trump, President Donald Trump should feel that's forthcoming, I think we do get a termination of the Mueller investigation. And then you have chaos. You will have a, a state of chaos in government uh, more specifically the White House, because you'll have upheaval from Congress um, and even the Senate, which, you know, is basically supporting this investigation. And so instead of a focus being on tariffs, the focus shifts to, I don't want to say survival, that sounds too dire, but I, I think you know what I mean. It, the focus will shift you know, toward, you know, away from the tariffs and toward uh, fixing this investigation versus the administration fallout. Yeah, it seems like the market is really just shaking this whole thing off completely. I mean, there's, there's really, it seems like to Americas. I was watching this coverage of the Black Hills motorcycle run from South Dakota, and everybody there is you know, the economy is doing great. The president's doing great. Everything's great. And it's as if this whole investigation doesn't exist. It's as right. if the whole tariff problems don't exist. It seems like there's like almost like two Americas. And I wonder if it's a situation where like, as long as the market is still rallying, then there's not, this is all kind of smoke. And, you know, will, you know, if, you know, how much chaos does have to happen before the market actually takes it seriously and sells off? Because as long as the market doesn't seem too worried about it, everybody else doesn't seem too worried about it. You know, it's, it's, it's yeah. but it's coming to some sort of head, I guess, but uh, a, a large part of the country, I don't, I think doesn't listen to any of this new stuff or doesn't take any of it seriously at all. And just is like, just, I think we'll find out. Tonight, right? Yeah. I think, I think, is it, is the um, congressional vote tonight for uh, the uh, the Ohio? I think it's Columbus District Twelve or something. 
Um, I think the vote is tonight. And depending on that, I, I, I would think from a sentiment standpoint to have a Democrat pretty much running neck and neck with a traditional, you know, Republican base, Republican, um, you know, congressional base there in that district um, tells you that either the tariffs are weighing on the average citizen, whether it's sentiment or actual monies. Um, um, or it's, or it's not, I, th I think that vote will, will, will kind of have a better indicator on whether this, you know, like you said, there's a, you know, two United States is ones that, you know, don't listen to the media and don't care and just focus on the fact that they have tax relief and there's more money, you know, in their paycheck than there used to be or, or not. You know, I think a lot of that'll be discovered. Yeah, because you and I know that a tariff is is essentially a tax, and yeah. you know the market loved the tax cuts, but now we have a tax sort of added, and uh, um, and the, the other issue is of course the 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 ballooning national debt, which seems to keep getting rolled back. But um, that's a that's one of those. It's like Hercules. I mean, there's there's no stopping except there's no stopping that that ball from rolling down this hill. Or Atlas, um, you know, eventually things are going to come to this is all going to end very badly. Make, make make no mistake about it. Look, I participate in the market that we have. You know, this is the market that we have. Uh, I could we could easily you know sit here and go through why the national debt, why consumer debt, why household debt, corporate debt is at record levels and should be something to pay attention to. The only caveat there is none of that results in the in 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 a in the end of a bull market. That's not what causes the end of a bull market. Uh, you know, those are amplifiers. So so when we get into a bear market or a, a a recession, the amount of debt amplifies the depth of that recession. But they don't end cycle. They don't end the bull cycle. They just keep ratcheting up. If you look at all those metrics uh, or, or all those categories of debt, they only go up. That's all they do. They go up. Over time, that's all that happens is they go up. Why? Uh, you know, part of it is just population. Part of it is population. Part of it is inflation. Part of it is the cost of education, health care, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, for, for people that say, oh, you know, look at our national deficit. Why is the market still going up? Because they, they, they're not correlated to that, you know, to that degree. Uh, so sometimes I, I find it funny that, you you know, you catch a lot of these people on, you know, on social media going, oh, you know, we just hit a record, you know, whatever trillions in, in household debt. And I'm like, well, it sounds like people have jobs then if they're willing to take on more debt. You have to kind of put this into perspective. Yeah, I, I agree with you totally. Um, it's funny. I had somebody on uh, the show uh, a couple months ago who is, you know, doom and gloom. And, uh, you know, this the end is near and it sells uh, YouTube subscriptions. She's exploded past my channel you know, she says every week, she says, this is the end and the market's going straight down and people love it and they, they subscribe and all this stuff. And my message of like, we're going to slowly rally doesn't get the same reception, you know, as, as even though that's what's happening, you know, it doesn't get the same reception. But um, yeah, this, the market seems to uh, not be correlated with what you see on uh, the, the news. Uh, ooh. Oh, that's my dog. Oh, nice. Calm down. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it, it's amazing that, that everything seems to be shaken off as far as tariffs, as far as these investigations and stuff. And I, I hesitate to really take it seriously until we see the market start to take it seriously, it seems. And yeah. I, maybe that's uh, not the right way to look at it. Yeah, I mean, to your, to your point, the liquidity aspect of that equation again, is, is your amplifier. When things go bad, as we saw them go bad in February, they go bad quickly because, the, the, because of the lack of liquidity. Uh, so 
it's great when things are going in the right direction and when they're correlated properly. Markets should go along with earnings. Earnings are trending higher. Markets should trend higher. Oh, well, the P value, you know, the valuation, the price to earnings multiple. We're human. <laughs> when things are good, we follow good. You could stretch the PE out to wherever you like, as long as earnings are going in that direction. The market will follow. So when you know another, when people say the market's overvalued, it is historically, but that doesn't stop the appetite. It just doesn't. And then you have the factor. Yeah. Another another factor the bears continue to misappropriate is you're you're trying to be bearish, or you're or you are actually implementing, you know, uh, short positions on the spiders or you know SPX puts, if you will, in a market where corporate buybacks are at record levels and projected to break a trillion dollars this year. That. I'm sorry. That is just like ramming your head into a wall. Was, there, there's a reason why the market didn't double bottom, but people say, oh, well, it was, it was a W, but I'm sorry. That was not a double bottom. Okay. They, we never revisited that low right. from February that we hit. That's we true. came near it, but we didn't revisit it. The fact is that you know, we came out of a blackout period for buybacks entering where, where, where corporations could start putting money to work again and buy back their own shares. A trillion, that's just, that's a huge headwind if you're bearish. But to yeah, my I'm point a, on, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Uh, okay. I was going to say to my point on liquidity, when things go bad, they go bad quickly because we, we've lost an element of liquidity in the market. It, you know, the biggest appetite in the market is buybacks. The retail investor is not going to get hurt to the extent they did in the past. Why? The retail investor or the household investor has actually been withdrawing from this market for the bulk of the year. They've extrapolated some $57 billion worth of, you know, equity value from the market this year. They're net sellers. Hedge funds, mutual funds, they are net sellers this year. So absent corporate buybacks and just your general market participation, uh, when things go bad, they go bad very quickly. February didn't last for a long period of time. February through March, I mean, that was roughly four weeks of really just bad activity. But post then, again, you had kind of your backstop. In the absence of the Fed, which you know used to basically be provide the market with liquidity, but now they're draining the market of liquidity. We've, we have a bridge and that bridge is corporate buybacks. That makes sense. Yeah. So how have you been managing your, uh, your trade in, in the short vol lately? I've seen you scalping back and forth sort of, are you, are you, uh, behaving in a similar way to the way you were last year, having sort of a core position and sort of trading a little around it? Um, or, and, and how would you recommend to, uh, sort of smaller retail investors to, to trade the, the short vol trade at, at this time? I'm just updating, actually. We had a trade on target we initiated yesterday, so now I'm... Yeah, we um, just had the open. If you want to take a look for a second. <laughs> uh, sold to you at 82.37. Nice profit. Yeah, we initiated a scalp on this... Uh, target yesterday, ticker TGT, um, thinking, you know, that we could get it up to low 82s and, and that's where it is. So I just needed to take care of that. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's um, fine. That's fine. Yeah. I, this year hasn't changed. My participation hasn't changed dramatically. Uh, but with that, something I try to invite folks who participate in the short vol trade is that every year your your characterization or understanding of the volatility trade should evolve so last year it was a short every spike year it just it was working out that way that's how the year developed and that's how it ended 
this year came into the year. I characterized it as what I thought would be the long against the box trade for short, short vol, meaning you have a core short volatility position, but there's going to be periods where you can do position long against that short vol position. So for instance, this year also, I didn't want leverage. I didn't want the UVXY or TVIX because I thought this year would have elevated volatility. When you look back at last year, what else could you expect? I mean, we're really going to go down to sevens and sixes on the VIX. It would be far-fetched, especially with Fed tightening and, and, and offloading their balance sheet. Uh, so we thought there would be opportunities to deleverage. Um, so my short core position is, is mainly just VXX. I still have some TVIX just because reverse split after reverse split after reverse split. You just, you know, I mean, but it's minuscule so far as the number of shares I own. Um, but UVXY is what I've been using long. Mm -hmm. So, because most brokerages won't allow you to have a VXX long position and a VXX short position. They'll, well, they'll let you have it, but you'll have to cover your short before you execute out of your long position. So that just doesn't work for me because I want to hold on to that short position long term. So that's why I use UVXY as the long position. Um, so that's what's changed for me. It's what helped me get through the February period, um, as well as just not having, you know, too much exposure. Uh, you know, I had limited exposure going into that event. So um, I was able to not only, you know, not only withstand it, but add positions into that event. And, you know, since then, just benefit from the decay. Um, you know, and here we are sick from March, what, five months later, you know, basically five months later before we got into the low 30s. We're below 30 now, but let's call it the low 30s in five months. And it's typical. I mean, it's typical because this is pretty much the situation that happened in August 2015, where you saw the VIX explode. And we had the same kind of rhetoric around, oh, the short vol idiots. Um, but it wasn't, you know, February of 2016, you were right back to the share prices you were before August two, 2015. Event. So it's a, it's, it generally takes a good five, six months before, thing, before the VIX exchange traded products normalize their pricing in accordance with term structure. It takes... It takes about that long. So. so it's kind of the same thing you've been saying the whole time, which is yeah. keep it a little bit small, down. right? Keep it a little bit small, have the enough bullets so that you can withstand the spike and right. just hang out and it comes back. And that's, that's what's happened. Yeah, you know, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, not, not too much has changed. The, the products work as they're designed. The VIX does what it's supposed to because the market does what it's supposed to. Do you think that we'll, um, do you think, I mean, we lost a couple products, obviously, in that big spike. Do mm -hmm. you think that there's going to be an appetite at some point to uh, to gain products? I would think that at some point someone's going to step up and say, you know, here's, obviously TVIX still exists, but either issue options on a TVIX type thing or like add a new a new leverage product in because uh, somebody is going to have appetite for, to take this risk to the short side again, I would think. Uh, a lot of these things, you know, UVXY lever. I don't think it will ever re-lever again, but it seems like there there is a spot for a product that's leveraged short uh, more than two times at some point. I don't know. It, I guess the volumes are down. I I, I think, yeah, I, I think these will get re-levered and delevered over the course of time. Uh, you know, these fun these funds want to make money and I think it's all evolutionary and, and cyclical. I no, I should, I should rather say, I think it's cyclical. We're in a environment right now where it was smart to deleverage these pro some of these products and we'll be in an environment at some point in the future where it will be smart for them to leverage up again. 
I, I don't think it's stat. I, I think a lot of people think that, you know, these products are once, once these changes are made, they're set in stone. They can never be changed again. I, I don't subscribe to that theory. So what's the next big, I always sort of ask you this, but what's the next big, uh, um, catalyst for a, for a, a spike? Is it still the midterms kind of, uh, is it, the, is it U S politics or is it, is it something else? I mean, obviously we don't know when a spike's going to happen. That's why it happens, but yeah, I, I mean, you can game out the probabilities, um, of when a spike is going to happen, but you know, you also have to de define a spike. You know, are we talking about something that like on the magnitude of February or just the general, you know, hey, the VIX is right, 10. 13 or 15. Let's, let's go out and provide protection for our portfolio. You get that. I mean, there was a uh, there was a trade put on just yesterday. CBOE reported of, you know, they could you can define when something is protection or not. So when you have VIX sub 12, people think it's cheap and they just start hedging their long portfolio with VIX options and futures and what have you, um, or SPX options. Um, so a normal spike is probably imminent, you know, something that gets us back to 13 maybe, but a big spike I, I think is going to center on one of two things, the Mueller investigation or tariffs, because it's all fun and games until tariffs are realized. Uh, and it's all fun and games until there's something formally stated concerning the, the Mueller investigation. So one of those team think one of those two things should cause a spike within the, a, a more serious spike within the next 30 days. In my opinion. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, it's really hard for, you know, I've been telling people like, you know, to initiate a short, a short in one of these things right, right now, even though Contango's up and even though, uh, you know, even though Contango's up and there's, there's definitely drag on a UVXY or TVIX, it, it can be hard for people to, to, to pull the trigger. It, obviously, no matter where you short it, if you wait long enough, it's going to work. Yeah. But I, I tend to like trying to tell people like wait for a little pop before you put some position on. If you did put a position on in a pop, then certainly I would say, you know, keep riding it short now. But it, it's very hard for people. It's very hard to, to recommend to people to uh, initiate a position with VIX 11. Now, uh, 11 is the low maybe of this year after February. But if you look at it in the context of two years, it's like yeah. the middle, you know. So yeah. <laughs> just because the year happens to start in Jan what if the year started like right now? Well, it's not, it's not the low if year if the year is August to August. So right. it's, it's all sort of relative. That's why I also focus on the geopolitical, the macroeconomic picture because, or the, in the market environment, because you, the VIX, the VIX follows that, uh, you know, the, the, over time, the VIX portrays those, those issues. If geopolitical tensions are rising, the VIX tends to rise. If if the macro doesn't look so good, the VIX tends to rise. If the macro looks better because earnings are looking good, because global growth is looking good, the VIX tends to express complacency. Um, in my opinion, and I see this from a lot of VIX specialists, if you follow the market sentiment, if you follow the macroeconomic picture, you tend to perform well um, as a as a VIX trader. Now, so, is is earnings over now that Apple has declared and Apple's nope. gone o up? Is that is that the defining event of earnings it's cycle? Huge. It is huge because it has so much market waiting. So yeah, it's definitely huge. But the retail sector has the economic weighting. So if we get some, you know, if we get some bad forecast or bad reporting from the retailers, uh, which isn't likely, it's not likely because retail sales have been just fantastic. They have been, especially the July. Yeah, the July report. Uh, it was one of the 
best year over year uh, growth rates for retail sales um, in, in some 12, 12 months or so. So the retail retailers should report well. The only problem might come from uh, profit margins uh, for the sm for those retailers that can't buy back their stocks. So those that are in trouble, like Sears and J.C. Penney and and others that just don't buy back shares, their share price movement is 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 more dependent on on those share buybacks, Bed Bath and Beyond, whose just gross margins have been on a, I mean, a four year downtrend. It's just a really bad situation. Um, but Target, Walmart, these guys should be reporting good sales. Uh, we can talk about earnings with them, but they're not as important because they have huge buyback programs and they have dividends. Um, so that's not as important to me over time, their gross product, that's not as important. What's important to me is their actual sales. You get a good report from Target, you get a good report from Walmart, um, we should be in, you know, in good hands. But if you have these retailers that have run up so much, issue lackluster reports, the market's gonna second guess things, in my opinion. A lot of people aren't, don't subscribe to what I'm saying because the the retail sector portion of the market isn't that big and it doesn't have your, you know, your Amazon weighted into it. Like Amazon's in the consumer discretionary sector. Um, but I, I think the market is going to say, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. All we've heard is that, you know, the consumer spending money, but if it doesn't pan out for the retailers, something's wrong here. Um, so, and especially with all the consolidation in the retail sector, mattress firm just reported yesterday they're probably going to file for bankruptcy and close a number of stores. Toys R Us, we all saw what happened there. Sears, this may be their last holiday. Mm. I hate to say it, but all signs are pointing to that. The amount of financial engineering that Eddie Lampert has done in monetizing some of the assets that he's done have resulted in zero for the for the shareholder and zero for that actual brand. At some point, the creditors, and they may have only said, okay, this is it. This is your final year. Because then what do we get? What are we actually going to come to bankruptcy court with if we give you even more time that doesn't reward in any way uh, or stabilize the company in any way? So this may be it for Sears. This may be their last fourth quarter and the entire company. Well, I noticed the Sears and the mall by my house is gone. I mean, they just shut the door and that, that that's it. Um, so did the corporate tax cuts that the Trump administration uh, pu pushed through, um, th did those translate essentially into just companies buying back their stocks or does it actually translate yeah. into wage wage growth at all? Wage I mean, I, this is like, a, this, Wage growth. right. This is like, uh, I was watching a, a, a liberal show and they were saying, you know, all the tax cuts did was make executive richer because it, it made the companies buy back their stocks, which all the executives own and they made more money in the stock market. And meanwhile, the normal people on, on the street, it, it, the tax cuts didn't help them at all. Is that a legitimate, uh, political point to make? It's, it's a talking point. Why? Because Factually, it's true. Most of the tax cuts are going to go to buybacks. Um, but we do have a bump. It's not like we don't have a bump in CapEx spending, which goes to the economy. You know, that does go to the economy. economy. But it, I mean, it, it's like saying, not, you know, maybe 80% goes to buybacks and, and, and corporate, you know, executive pay bonuses and whatnot, and only 20% goes to the economy. That's unbalanced. So it, it is true, but so far as wage growth, there's, if you look at, you know, the St. Louis Fed or, you know, you go to Fred's website and you look at wage growth, let me see if I can show you my screen, share my screen. There, there's no such thing as wage. I mean, there's, when, it, when it's adjusted for inflation, there's never really been wage growth in America. It's so slight that, 
it, it bears even talking about. So uh, let's see what I can do here. Well, also, the, the job market switches. You know, it's, it, it, it's exactly. switching to different things that people do these days. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, you see this chart? Yep. This is wage growth since the 1980s. Since the 1980s, we've gone from about, let's call it 337 for median usual weekly real earnings, wage and salary workers 16 years and older. About 337, we are now right around 350. Yeah, so. That's, that's uh, almost four, so 38 years. And, and we really haven't gone anywhere. So when people talk about, well, there's no wage growth, uh, you know, this is another talking point for the, uh, that the bears like to promote. I'll stop sharing my screen now. Let's see. Oh, there you go. That they like to promote, but it, it's, it's not relative. It's it just doesn't mean it. It's like saying, as I noted before, debt only goes higher. Yields only go lower. Uh, which is another bear talking point. You know, they say, well, when yields get back up to 3%, who cares? When they get to 3.5%, who cares? Yields never touch the previous bull market cycle high. We have to get to 5%, above 5% to touch the 2000, well, the crash that happened in, you know, that, so we could say it ended in 2007, the last bull market. We have to get up to 5%. The Fed's neutral rate is nowhere near that. But we're talking about yields as if and yields and rates as if they're uh, you know, predictors of the next recession or once what again, could cause the next recession. Yeah, and, and once again, three is just a round number. It doesn't it doesn't yeah. uh, it's not an inflection point other than a psychological round right. number. I think that the American worker to protect you know to they need to try to participate in the market and that's what's going to ultimately insulate them and going to uh increase their 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 uh worth is to somehow participate in the market whether you're uh you know a corporate ceo or you're working at a, a gas station you know somehow you need to participate in the market because that's where you're going to get your growth from exactly so yeah well, I, it's not that i don't appreciate some of the things that some of the conversation that a lot of you know market pundits bring to the table it's that they paint such a dire picture they almost over sensationalize their which doesn't correspond to what's happening in the market at all doesn't, and, it, and it does scare people and keeps yeah. them away i don't have an appreciation for that because look you most people, the average American is not going to retire well from their job. Um, if we just look at, you know, reflation and uh, the average hourly earnings that I just showed you, um, it just, those two don't fit. So if you, if you scare people out of the market, that's just one more thing, you know, one more aspect of potential uh, wealth building that you're denying them. So there's a way to educate people about the ills of the economy or market cycles. Um, and there's a way not to. And I see a lot of people on social media, even when they're wrong, they're proven wrong. They just keep promoting it anyway. They just keep pounding the table with the same thing. You were just proven wrong, hit your level, went higher, it's still higher, but you keep you still keep beating that drum. Yeah. yeah. That then you have an agenda I can't you know morally support. Um, folks like Lance Roberts, um, he's 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 a very articulate person. He knows his history when it comes to the market, when it comes to the economy. But the caveat to a lot of his work is there is no history for what we have today. There's no history for a prolonged period of quantitative easing followed by quantitative tightening and uh, injected with a tax stimulus policy all in one. There's no history for that. 
plus so all you, the buybacks, all the, the fact yeah, of uh, structure failure. changing due to uh, passive investing. Yes. Yeah, I mean, yeah. there's just so much difference in this, in the modern economic cycle that if you if you try to correlate it to history, you have to have a huge standard deviation implied in your thesis or your models because they, there's just no way to say this compares with then or should compare yeah. with then. So there's a lot of folks out there in social media and they have tons of followers, tons and tons of followers. And a lot of times I'll, I see a tweet, I'll question, I'll pose a question and either the person won't respond or they'll respond in a way that is it's wrong. It's, you know, they'll, they'll deviate. I'm like, well, was there a time when QE then quantitative, then tax policy, then corporate buybacks, do you have a standard deviation? And they, you know, they divert and people would like it. They, they'll, they'll like that particular response from the initial po you know, tweet, um, as opposed to focus on the fact that maybe I've introduced something that you should think more broadly about. Yeah, because they and start with the conclusion, and then they, they start with the conclusion, and they look for evidence of it. You know, yeah, they're not yeah, interested just, in actual. Well, in, in yeah, it's actually it's just bias creep. You want it to be right, so you force it upon, you know, others, when, even when proven wrong. Uh, but I've been doing that for a good, for the last two years, and 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 we've just done nothing but continue this this bull cycle. You know, because th this is different. This is nobody likes to say this. This time is different. Nobody wants to, you know, promote that this time is different. But I've been saying that for the last two years. There, there just is a, by definition, this time is to every time is different. You know, the 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 recession, the Great Recession of two, that was different. Did we have subprime mortgages to forecast? As to this would be a recessionary, you know, type event, uh, you know, from these products, we didn't. No, no. Why? Because yeah. that time was different, and the results, the amplification, was to every time is different. Mm. It's it, it does it comes down to perspective, and and your ability to take the confluence of variables and and, and paint the right picture, or, or as accurate a picture as you can. I, I'm open to being wrong. I've been wrong many a times, um, but I, I pride myself on at least trying to to weigh the, the pros and cons, the bears and the bulls, and pick you know a middle course that I think I can do well on. All right. Well, listen. Right, well, listen uh, uh, this has been another been good, good conversation. conversation. And uh, I appreciate you coming on. Hopefully you'll uh, indulge me with, uh, with coming on again soon. Uh, it's been too long. How long has it been? Like three, About four five, months or something? five months, maybe. Yeah, something yeah. like I'm that. I'm looking yeah. forward to your upcoming interviews as well. I know that um, I have actually am going to uh, up my sponsorship um, from, my, from my originals. I love your content. I, I want to see uh, more of it and, you know, more guests. So you know if, if, if well thank you i appreciate all your support from the beginning you've been you were probably my first supporter on on twitter and i, I really appreciate it. things have grown a little bit since then but uh you, you know you were one of the first people to actually like my comments and that sort of thing and it, it, it means a lot to me that you uh that you've been uh supporting me the whole time so thank you so much for that that's a, it's a huge thank thing yeah thank you for having me all right. Well, uh, good luck with the market today. I know you're probably like I am kind of looking over at the screens here and, and eager to go as we uh, we kind of went through the open. Uh, but uh, thanks again for uh, appearing. And we gave people, I think, something to think about as we uh, continue through this earnings cycle. And next up is retail. Uh, thanks, uh, Seth. And um, thanks, everybody, for watching. And we'll see you again soon. Take care. All right. All right. Uh, I'll cut it there. Okay. Thanks All a lot. Right. That seemed cool. Thank you. Thank you very much. I got to run. I got a meeting, but yep. uh, this was great. Always love being on your show, Dave. Okay, great, Seth. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for doing this.